Welcome to PRS in Conversation. I'm James Bubar. If you're new to the PRS YouTube channel, the Philosophical Research Society YouTube channel, uh, please do subscribe. And you can visit prs.org for updates on events. Uh, you can visit the uh, expanded online bookstore. I think recently I've seen that they've added uh, the used books, uh, which is pretty amazing. And uh, also you could, you could make a donation. Uh, whichever way you do it, we really appreciate your, your, your support and uh, your engagement. Uh, tonight, uh, in Izmir tonight anyways, it's a hot Izmir night and uh, there's a beautiful moon coming your way, uh, just to, to, to let you know, uh, Liz. And uh, tonight in Izmir, but high noon, a little after high noon in uh, Los Angeles, uh, I'm joined by Elizabeth T. Vasquez. And uh, it's great to have you on because she just had a big uh, retrospective of a, of a really cool event that happened last year at, uh, at PRS. We'll talk about it. But uh, Elizabeth uh, T. Vasquez is a first-generation Amer Mexican-American artist, activist, writer, and filmmaker from Los Angeles. She earned a BA in film from the Arts University Bournemouth and is currently a screenwriting fellow at the American Film Institute. She has been attending the Philosophical Research Society since 2017, and her work has been shown all over the world, and she may have the coolest Instagram username I've ever heard called uh, Strip Mall Dreams. Uh, so maybe, maybe we'll talk a little bit about that. that. We can maybe do a whole conversation about how that relates to, <laughs> to spiritual seeking and... Uh, I guess from a Gnostic sense, uh, I appreciate that, that a lot. Anyways, recently, uh, as of, I think it was this weekend, we did the well-born uh, Seeking Truth Beyond the Western Lexicon, Lexicon event. And so I'm, I'm really thankful, Liz, that you could join us to talk about, to talk about that. So uh, thank you. Thank you, James. I'm very excited to, to be speaking with you. Yeah, and uh, we don't just want to drag you out to talk about that uh, particular event because it was on YouTube uh, recently, but we're hoping to you know, learn more about uh, your work, your art, your, your spiritual seeking as it relates to PRS and your amazing film work. Uh, but it's become a tradition, and maybe it's one I forced on everybody, but maybe uh, hopefully you'll indulge me. But uh, we've, we've started these conversations with the, with the origin story. I know you, you've been a member of PRS, uh, the community, very active since 2017. So I'm wondering if you can start with you know, how you came upon the community, what brought you into it, and initial kind of impact on your, your seeking or, or maybe your development as an artist. Absolutely. Um, I mean, I, I know everyone always has an interesting story with PRS. Yeah, it's inevitable. Yeah. Good. Well, um, I'm, I'm glad it's not just. Me, I'm glad it's not me just projecting. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> it's just the the mystery that surrounds that place. You know, you wouldn't want it any other way. Yeah. Um, and so I came to it through my old housemate. She was actually a bartender, and um, she met Greg and. From what I remember, um, she was in an argument with another patron about God, wow. <laughs> as you do as a bartender. Yeah. And um, Greg overheard that conversation, and Greg stepped in and along with um, his wife, Whitney, mm -hmm. and that was kind of like the beginning of a friendship between them. And uh, my housemate knew that I was already kind of interested in a lot of these things, like esoteric wisdom and... Mm -hmm just like, you know, hot spots in Los Angeles because I'm from here as well. Yeah. And so she brought me in and we started going to lectures on Tuesday nights. And it was just like, after the first one, I was like, I'm sold. I'm coming here every week. Um, and I think that was I'm trying to remember what the series was. Oh, it was um, Gods and Monsters. Oh, so that yes. was the series. Yeah. A, cl a classic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and there were so many synchronicities that were happening around that time kind of the lead up to uh, my ex-housemate bringing me there and also mm -hmm. just like uh, kind of uh, experiencing an awakening of my own going into like my, my late 20s and mm -hmm. really having to question a lot of things around my uh, my own origins as well. And mm -hmm. So it kind of just came together in a very uh, hero's journey kind of way. Yeah. 
Yeah. That, that's kind of the gist of it. And yeah, I just kind of immediately um, found a voice there. I found a home where I could express that voice. And it was the first time really that I felt um, kind of encouraged by, by mm. strangers in a sense, in a way that didn't feel like there were ulterior motives or that felt like um, people were trying to get me to think or be a certain way. It was, yeah. it was very freeing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's interesting when I hear these stories so often the word mystery and home come up and often we're not used to seeing that them together in a, in a way, like when we encounter story, the mystery has to happen like out there or be solved to go home. But something about PRS, uh, there's the, the, the mystery is ongoing, but yet you're home to kind of fall into the mystery. And it is the place uh, as well that you said that's so mysterious, but it's these little interactions that are such a mystery. <laughs> the one you described is, is great. And the people you meet are such a, such wonders. So I really, yeah. I, I miss it being far away. I, I spent many years there and I know everyone, everyone misses it right now. And uh, I'm curious if you happen to attend or watch uh, uh, Greg's amazing lecture series on L L Los Angeles. Yeah, yes. yeah. I, I most times. <laughs> What's up? He did that twice. He did that series twice. So yeah. I was there for, for both of them. Yeah, I really, I really encourage the listeners to to check that out. He really does a deep dive into the many. You know, LA is often seen. Um, I think by narratives outside of the, I don't know, vested air narratives in, in the entertainment industry and making it a certain way. But there's so many interesting competing uh, stories when you get into LA and voices that are often marginalized. You, you address this in your work that are coming out. Uh, so it's a, it's a great lecture series that's, that's available on, uh, on the YouTube channel. So as, as you've been, um, cause you've been, you know, you, you're an, you're an artist, you're a filmmaker, writer, as you've been going to PRS on this, this be, kind of the beginning of the, I, I love the the hero's journey that you brought up because that <laughs> that conversation in the bar almost was like the call, you know, the call to the adventure, and then you're going around and you you meet the helpers uh, that you've met uh, at, at PRS. So I'm wondering how you, I guess, have grown as a as a, I mean, whether in, in the kind of, I guess, what surprises in your growth as either an artist or I mean, a person, a seeker, uh, that maybe you want to reflect or highlight on, highlight about a little right now? I think um, something that was really happening was like um, all these like simultaneous culminations of things that I kind of explored as, even as a child, interests that I had. But I never really, um, again, like kind of sat down and found the connections between them. And yeah. so when I started attending these lectures, the way that uh, Greg was presenting so many of the topics in, you know, in a kind of informal way, and yet yeah. in a way that was deeply profound, which of course is part of their mission statement. Um, it was something that was speaking to me of not just like something that was happening in like the last couple of years, but really just my entire life, things that drew, drew me to certain stories, um, certain topics and themes and characters. Wow. and realizing that it was all these mythologies. And, um, yeah. you know, I, I studied uh, film production when I was an undergrad and mm -hmm. I, my focus was actually cinematography. Mm -hmm. And so even though we did have uh, theory classes and I also had a background in art and some creative writing, mm -hmm. there was never that like full on uh, immersion into mythology. A lot of the mythology that I knew was actually coming from from home, from my parents, especially my mom, and it was mm -hmm. coming from like the tales of our ancestors uh, wow. being, you know, Mexican, yeah. and you know, things like uh, learning about the Day of the Dead, right, and like mm -hmm. the significance of our connection to the ancestral and to the spiritual, and like mm -hmm. starting to really see these stories, like La Llorona or Santa Muerte, in mm -hmm. reflected in some of these other mythologies and like starting to you know really expand upon my awareness in like a, both the spiritual and intellectual sense um kind of like straying away from what the question was <laughs> oh, the str uh, straying is the best part of these conversations so <laughs> feel free <laughs> but i was struck by uh again the, the the pairings of words that often come because I love how you said that you, you you had sensed this in a way your your whole life in, in these other stories and in in the 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 work or the the wisdom or the offerings you encountered at through PRS whether in, in formal lectures or in conversations 
you know, it helps you give a language. So it's, it's almost something that is allows you to then recognize something that's been there and then, and then deepen, deepen the search, but also community. And I think, uh, I know we're going to get into Wellborn, but one of the, the kind of Western paradigms is, you know, the individual, especially in America, right, is, you know, the individual pulling himself up and kind of creating himself, making himself. But that aspect of, of community and PRS helping to give that language, helping to share those stories. I mean, it was there from your, it sounds like from your, you know, your, your ancestor stories and from your parents directly telling you, but this really notion of, uh, the language helping us recognize and, and give, give a, a way to explore deeper these aspects that we're so interested in, but, but doing it in community. It's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess that's the other thing too. It's like, um, I, I never really got that sort of community mm. because I was moving around a lot or okay. uh, felt ostracized by the communities that were around me in some way. So yeah. suddenly, uh, find a group of people who have shared experiences and having felt like they were on their own for so long and suddenly, mm -hmm. you know, being able to engage with one another, like, Oh, you, you thought this as well. And you're not crazy. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And now let's think about it some more. Yeah. Not only yeah. are you not crazy, but read this or let's talk about this or have you heard about that? Yeah. That's that, yeah. that's that manly hall, just insatiable curiosity for things that are emanating from this tradition of esoteric or even suppressed wisdom traditions. And, and it, it's one of my favorite things about, about PRS and, I think I've said this before, but I really miss this kind of incredibly abundant calendar <laughs> that's just churning out events, whether, you know, and now we're, it's coming out online as much, but it's really an amazing, every, every day you almost have something different at PRS. So uh, that's a nice reflection of, of what you're saying. Yeah, very activating. Yeah, I, I was curious about, you know, I hope we don't go into a, a, well, I guess we can go into a rabbit hole to some degree. But uh, I lived in LA uh, many uh, many years, uh, you know, multiple, multiple decades. And I happened to live in places kind of before they uh, were cool, <laughs> I think. So uh, Hollywood, when it was still pretty much of a disaster, not a disaster, but uh, the, it was very, uh, very grungy, very dirty, a very, you know, pretty dangerous certain places. I lived in Silver Lake when it was mostly an immigrant uh, area. And I kind of watched it grow up into this hip way expensive place and what strikes me and this is i think from a more modern american dominant culture perspective about how la is seen as on the one hand this kind of place this idenic place for regeneration you know to go and kind of create your dreams and kind of reinvent yourself and it goes deep into this um uh, mythological dimension of, of a space and you can see it churning out in stories about LA and then there's also another dominant narrative of like the LA Babylon you know <laughs> the apocalypse the end of the world uh, that, that's shown in like the noir uh, novels right the crime novels um, yeah. but but both of those things impact every resident who's kind of there but one of the other narrative the all a lot of the other narratives about LA get suppressed because of the kind of power of these two. And this is some of the, the Mexican uh, uh, communities that have come, the Mexican-American first generation communities like yourself, some of the vibrancy, even there's a vibrant Russian community and there's, there's a seeker community and PRS. So I'm very interested in these, in, in these stories that are looking at LA in a different way than the two dominant ones of like this, land of gold and honey to reinvent yourself and go after your dreams or this noir LA Babylon, you know, decadence. So I'm curious growing up there as a first generation, as someone who became, you know, an artist and a writer, how LA has kind of shaped your, your thinking, your being, if you encountered some of these things that, that I'm seeing or I saw. Absolutely. Uh you know, one of my favorite things about the lecture series that Greg brought up um, with, uh, you know, Los Angeles was the writings of Mike Davis and mm -hmm. uh, the book mm -hmm. you're forgetting as well by Norman Klein, I believe. And when I started reading those, it really shaped it again into to some sort of like form that I could uh, really dig into was mm -hmm. this experience of having grown up watching these simultaneous realities both emerging and then completely being destroyed 
Right. Uh, and so, you know, growing up around it, one, one of my favorite anecdotes is like, because I, I grew up mostly in the Valley. Nice. And really? I, I, I lived yeah. in, I lived in, I lived in North Hollywood forever. It was, the, I loved it. I loved it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, I mean, it, it's really interesting here because you get that proximity of Los Angeles of what you're saying, you know, like the, the Babylon slash noir, but also, you know, this like wave of gentrification, which is much more, in my opinion, much more violent in Los yeah. Angeles, at least like, um, yeah. mm-hmm. more visibly so mm-hmm. than in the Valley, which, you know, the suburbs, but, um, yeah. but here it's like, there's a, there's also this kind of um, small town eeriness that maybe uh, would be best attributed to like Lynch's uh, <laughs> kind of ideas of suburbia. Right. And so yeah. there's that. And, and then some of the other stuff that seeps in. And so you have like all these things going on and then being so close to it was for a long time, the porn capital in the world, mm-hmm. which is like Chatsworth. Yep. Um, I remember like seeing around the houses, around friends' houses that lived in like those more affluent areas, uh, these trailers, these like star trailers and seeing like, oh, they're making a movie or they're making something and seeing the production crews. And that would be like on my way to school. And then by the time I was coming back home, they were all gone. And it wasn't until later that someone said, oh, they film a lot of porn there because <laughs> of the pools that they have. And like, mm-hmm. that's a whole industry. Like that was a huge yeah. part of a lot of people's affluence there as well. Right. And uh, realizing that, and also just like seeing sets being built. And, you know, one day you see like a, a corner that's abandoned suddenly becomes a gas station that's being, <laughs> um, you know, a, exploded or something. Like right. seeing that in like, a day-to-day reality mm-hmm. really makes you question a lot of things about what's presented to you. Yeah. And so, uh, like that was really what shaped me because I was already pretty inquisitive as a child. Like, mm. you know, what is real? Like, what is something that I can rely upon? And so. One of those other things too is seeing the disparity of like my reality having grown up initially low income and like, mm-hmm. you know, living in neighborhoods that were predominantly Latinx or black or, you know, mm-hmm. working class, but then going to schools that were predominantly white or predominantly mm-hmm. affluent and um, in some other way, like the very clear divide. And yet these were, you know, slightly different zip codes. And so mm-hmm. that also was, um, that almost like, you know, the Dubois-ian sense of the double consciousness for yeah. me of like, I'm yeah. experiencing these these two realities simultaneously. Mm-hmm. And then on top of that, I can see, I can turn on the TV and I can see something that was shot not too far from where I live and, right. you know, see it not in the movies, but see it in real life. And it's like a row of like homelessness or, you know, it's just, it really, um, I don't know if I can curse here, but <laughs> I was going to say like, <laughs> It really fucks with you. <laughs> I think that's okay. Yeah. Um, and so, like, that was always something that I wanted to explore more of in my work as far as, like, you know, what are our perceptions really um, kind of lead to? And also, you know, who is the, the holder of that perception? Because yeah. someone who is coming into my neighborhood who isn't from here and sees, like, uh, you know, this, like, quaint little store and they think it's, it's very cute because it, it shows like, oh, like this is the Mexican part of this community. They see it as um, as, as an object, in a sense. whereas someone it's like, right. that's, right. that's literally where I go to get food, you know? Yeah. And so yeah. all these like simultaneously, simultaneous perspectives happening on top of one another um, is very much like that Babylon, I guess, too, but just mm-hmm. like in a, in a very different way, one, one that isn't the, the spectacle of like apocalypse or, um, you know, this like decadent Hollywood lifestyle that right. everyone will like you know, think of the horrors of Hollywood, right? Right, right. And, you know, the Boulevard of Broken Dreams, the famous shot of uh, James Dean. But there is an amazing doubling. And this, this is, again, uh, probably a, a whole other conversation. Very interesting doubling of... Uh, the Valley versus Over the Hill in, you know, Hollywood, West Hollywood. It's very, very interesting. A lot of writers have dug into that and this mirroring and, and existing in, um, I mean, I, I loved North Hollywood. Again, much like when I was in Silver Lake, very, very, um, very, very, very immigrant culture, uh, and even Polish immigrants. I mean, a lot of immigrants, but, uh, but they told different stories about themselves, the cities, and it's a fascinating place to start thinking about 
you know, spiritual seeking because it is a wilderness isn't the right word. I guess it's very, it's very lush with narratives that are kind of competing, dominating, um, illusionary. So I think it, it is an amazing setting. And, and most people don't get this about LA. They think it's very superficial until they're there. But it's not to me a surprise that a place like PRS is there with Manly Hall providing the kind of language yeah. to start exploring these dishu- deeper issues of, you know, of uh, our lives, the meaning of our lives, uh, understanding wisdom traditions. It does go perfectly, even within this kind of swirl or this lush lushness of competing narratives. Not all, not all healthy, and certainly not all correct yeah. or or um, beneficial. Yeah. 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 So did it shape you as a filmmaker? I know you talked about the, you know, seeing the, the sets transformed and blown up and, you know, and then what's interesting is that the trailer leaves and then it's kind of maybe an out of, out of business place. And, you know, and then the community still stays. And I was always struck by that. They'd come in and make something look great from like the seventies or sixties even, and then they would leave and it would be, go back to this silent. A lot of the times they were abandoned or, or no longer um, working or even if they were, they weren't as nice as if they were in the movie. And then we keep living in yeah. that area. I'm curious as a filmmaker how that how that maybe shaped your your eye or your 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 the, the kind of stories you wanted to tell. Well, it definitely deterred me from wanting to do like um, big Hollywood productions, mm-hmm. like Marvel movies, etc. Um, even though, of course, you know, from the standpoint of success, like that's the most lucrative, right? Um, But it really did push me towards narratives of, like, you know, character-based narratives of focusing Mm -hmm. more of, like, who's Mm -hmm. who's in those situations. Um, I guess more documentary-style things Mm -hmm. initially. But even then, you know, questioning what is the basis of reality within the documentary. Um, Because a lot of reality TV is filmed around here, too. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, (laughs) You mean it's not real? uh, You mean reality TV? (laughs) No, I'm sorry. I'm just joking. (laughs) <laughs> reality tv is our politics right now unfortunately well that's the thing you know baudrillard said disneyland existed to make us think we live in a normal reality like in la suburbs and you can say the same thing uh that the reality tv exists to make us think that our our normal life is is kind of you know on, on fa- a solid foundation anyways we're getting off track sorry <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> what but as far as like you know as a, as a filmmaker i guess like I, um it does open me up to being more imaginative in a sense, you know, Mm -hmm. if things are already pretty, you know, kind of crumbling as far as the, um, like believability in something, then why not like go into the realm of, uh, you know, the fantastical of demons and (laughs) and like, you know, uh, sci-fi stories and things like that, even though that's not necessarily what I've been doing, but it does make me want to, pursue something that goes outside of this like forced imaginary that a lot of the Hollywood um, and even just like sto- dramatic narratives sometimes can gear us towards mm-hmm. because again, it's like you, you can't separate as much as one will try, you know, who's the voice, who's the narrator of the story. Right. Um, and so I think that's something that's really important with filmmaking is, you know, trying to really explore one's imagination. And so for me, like I, I love, David Lynch and I think that's a, a, also like a whole nother Los Angeles story right there yeah, yeah. Um, but even just like looking at Twin Peaks and I know that Greg's a huge fan of Twin Peaks as well mm-hmm. it, it's that way of like he captures this normality but also it, there's always that underlying sense of something coming out and I think that can be shown so much more if you're focusing more on like the characters or you're focusing on a particular setting really putting all that focus or emphasis on there uh, can create some really interesting turns and uh, situations, consequences of the story. Yeah. Well, I, it's, it's beautifully said. I was just thinking of uh, John Steinbeck when he talked about growing up in, um, well, I didn't grow up. He grew up in Salinas, but he ran away a lot to Monterey and, and it was, uh, he was in there, he was in Monterey for um, his early writing career and he talked about the Monterey, the whole area around that, that uh, the coast as a breeder of stories uh, because it had so many different kinds of people coming there and it had uh, different, uh, it was kind of wild freedom of 
stories colliding and he, he talks about it as a breeder of stories and i think la is more like that than than i think people think which is why i kind of brought up those dominant narratives they want it to be either the the land you know the, the golden land to regenerate or the, the decadent babylon but it's so much more complicated not only a kind of moving in population level uh, you mentioned uh, latinx but also the individuals who come to la you know almost everyone's from mm -hmm. somewhere <laughs> you're lucky that you grew up there. You're probably what I think I lived in LA. I came from Chicago. I think I lived in LA for, for years before I met someone who was from yeah. LA. Yeah. But everyone adopts it and kind of falls in love and starts their story. And it's a great symbol for the seeker. Uh, it does mirror that notion, whether you think of, you know, the, the, the existentialist, the Heide Heideggerian notion of being kind of thrown into the world and here you are. But it is a very rich place, not for stories, but for seeking. Yeah, absolutely. Or, you know, the stories are the vehicle. Right. For seeking. Right. Right. Yeah. And this is a good chance. I want to get into the to, to your film work, especially as it related to the, the Wellborn Project. But I just wanted to ask you about film. And you can think about this as <laughs> maybe how David Lynch might answer it. But I definitely want, uh, I want to know how you answer it as, as a film artist. And you're working in very interesting uh, creative work so far. And in terms of you know, as you mentioned, they're, you're not trying to do Transformers Five or, or something. You know, you're doing something different uh, with your with your art, and and this is kind of how I, I'm kind of stuck or I bounce between a couple of different um, ruminations of film. Uh, one of my favorite books is The Way to Rainy Mountain uh, by F. Scott Mamaday, and he's a very uh, po uh, very important early Native American uh, writer, and I probably kind of quote unquote kicked off the modern Native American uh, writing tradition of which many people followed. But he ends this uh, novel, and Greg will probably know the exact quote, uh, but he ends the novel where he's talking, the a character, the narrator's looking out at a, at a horizon, and he mentions this uh, notion of it's not so much where you look, but it's what you see. You know, this difference between looking and seeing. And then you can think about that as exoteric or the esoteric tradition or the active imagination versus the passive imagination. So in some ways, I think about film like that, especially your work, helping us see, not telling us what to see or just look at this image or look at this and then consume it, but how to see it. But then, I, I'm, you know, I'm not too far away from uh, I'm from I'm in I'm in Izmir, which was uh, ancient Smyrna. We've been around a long time. Uh, thousands of years, one of the seven one uh, one of the seven cities of revelations and the ancient Greek uh, civilization, of course. So we're not too far from <laughs> Plato's thought, and uh, you know he kicked the poets out of <laughs> out of the Republic because they stirred up the uh, the feeling, you know, stirred up the imagination. I mean, I think it's a little more complicated than that, but let's go with that. So it's this notion of be of this. I, I, this is what I want to your in, your input or your insight into is this notion of film allowing this almost esoteric, revelatory understanding and how to see versus Plato's cave, where the camera's actually the shadow, reflecting the shadows on the wall and telling us what to see. And in your amazing film, um, uh, uh, and I hope I don't pronounce it wrong, Neutrality, which is on uh, YouTube right now, you know, you bring up these propaganda images, you use them, uh, and no one understood better the power of film to, to make people look a certain, look at certain things and think certain things and feel certain things. And so it becomes an impetus to kind of freedom and, and understanding and that kind of even esoteric revelatory experience. So I don't know if you think about this way and what film does. I just wanted to throw it out because you're a filmmaker and if, if you think about either of those polls or the dialogue between or or if you have any uh, reaction to either of those figures as what they represent for my thinking about film today. Yeah, well, I mean, one thing I've, I've been thinking a lot about, um, and I also, I, I study astrology, so sometimes that language will seep its way into it. Mm. it but um, for me, it is the sense of like the Piscean nature of illusion that, media has really come to encompass mm -hmm. and so when we talk about uh you know the screen in a sense not yeah. just television but you know we have the right. advent of internet and everything 
um, we can see it as this this um, kind of what's the term I'm looking for, but like a like an oracle in a sense. Oh, it's it's a thing that we use, and it can be in that sort of Plato's cave way used uh, in this propaganda sense as well, mm -hmm. um, in a very specific way, mm -hmm. which does show us something. Right. Or we can use it in this way of like uh, the obsidian black mirror, where we're forced to look into something that yeah. reflects. It's ultimately a reflection of us and what's inside of us. Mm. And I think the stories that can do that, the, the ones that are the most meaningful, are often the ones that show us the things that we're most afraid of in ourselves. So yeah. it might be through the characters, it might be through um, certain actions, but. Yeah. You know, a lot of the times that's why I think horror is really interesting, and mm -hmm. I'm a huge fan of Heart of Guilt, right? Um, watching these stories like that, that I get out and um, I just watched um, I just watched that a couple of days ago. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. It's so brilliant. I mean, it, brilliant. it's brilliant. So exciting. Yeah. We're, we're seeing a lot of that too with um, the voices that are finally given a platform, mm -hmm. and even then, you know, it's sometimes I feel like it might be a little bit too too late. For, for certain aspects as far as like, you know, we should have had this kind of representation a long, long time ago. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we're, we're opening up a lot of new dialogues that I think yes. are, are bringing in these, these stories that can only have been experienced or, through certain struggles. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we're using the screen as like, again, this oracle of like shaping what we're doing and who we are. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if this answers the question but I, that was like the thought that came to mind it's like you know because when when we turn the screen off and we just see the black image that darkness that void mm -hmm. uh, we see our reflection and i think there's something so profound with that or especially you know if you're if you're watching something on like a netflix binge and then it's <laughs> over and then you're just left with the reflection of yourself like looking all <laughs> deteriorated after hours of you know watching something but right. that that to also the connection and I think a lot of filmmakers that are coming out are becoming so more uh, sentient about not just mm -hmm. like what the story is but like how it's being presented or the medium itself and like the context it's being presented in yeah yeah I'm, that was beautiful thank you because uh, uh, I'll be able to take those those words with me and uh, add them to the uh, to the mix uh, I love what you talked about with the, with the oracle but I'm curious about how astrology may have come more into your work. I don't think it's something that would be obvious in watching films. So maybe people would be your films at the moment anyway, mm -hmm. what I've seen. Uh, so I'm curious about how, uh, is that something that's been with you a while? Or is it something that's, I know we have an amazing astrology a faculty member at PRS. So if something is, if it's that something you talked about, the, the hero's journey, going back to kind of your the, the call at the bar and then meeting some helpers. Yeah. And, yeah. So I'm curious if that's something that, that has come more recently uh, into your life as a, a tool for expansion or understanding, or, or a tool is the wrong word, a practice for uh, mm -hmm. understanding and expansion, or is that something you have done a you had done for a while before? No, it actually came through the same housemate who introduced me. Interesting. To that that's a, yeah. sounds like a great helper. <laughs> yeah, she's definitely a mythical archetype in, mm -hmm. in my life. It's um, mm -hmm. someone who I had a falling out with, so we don't actually speak anymore. Interesting. And that's been itself like a, a big part of this journey. Mm. Um, but I used to be a total cynic. I interesting, <laughs> very skeptical cynic for such a long time, um, and that of course informed a lot of the types of stories I was telling then. Mm. And interesting, you know, really seeing the this like you know the archetypes, union archetypes, and mm -hmm. astrology. It's really just character building. Mm -hmm. It's deciding like what do I want? What are the weaknesses of this person? How are they working mm -hmm. on something? Um, and also, like, what is it that they feel shame around? What is it that they mm. are trying to heal? All these things have um, their places in, like, in astrological interpretations, whether it's looking at, like, Chiron in someone's chart, the wounded healer, mm. or it's looking at, like, you know, karmic connections that are built through, again, like, that Piscean um, kind of illusory, illusory mirror that's reflected to us. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, just like the, the way the ego plays a role in our actions, all these um, terms, this language 
it finds itself in film. And that's something, you know, I had to read the writer's journey when I was an undergrad and I had to read it again for grad school. <laughs> the connection is so blatant. Um, but yeah, it, 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 now that I look at it, something that I do is I always think about like, who are these characters or rather what's their astrological chart? So I'll be watching something and I'll say, you know, I think this person's like an Aries rising with a Virgo moon and like <laughs> really spicy sun, you know, I'll start trying to piece it together. But all that is, it's just um, these key terms for building out a clearer kind of abstract of a person. Yeah, that, that's beautiful. And um, it's, it's very interesting, especially now with the technology. I mean, the fact that we're having this conversation, uh, 10,000 kilometers or whatever away and uh and 10 hours apart and uh this this interconnection between these mythic you use the word archetypal stories combined with the ability to tell them this these stories create these stories affect others share with others through technology it's a pretty exciting time don't you think to be to be a, a filmmaker or a screenwriter, I guess I don't want to say it's been never been easier because it's a it's a difficult art, especially the art of screenwriting. But but to to kind of get something through to fruition and see it and share it is easier than before. Absolutely, yeah. There's less limitations, um, structural limitations. Right. Right. And I think one of the things that is really exciting too, it's just seeing what limitations can do, like how they do right. actually expand creativity. And mm. that's where the breakthroughs come through. So I'm excited to see not so much like what's happening in like the bigger scale things, but what is happening in mm -hmm. like the more localized sense mm -hmm. of advancement. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's, that's beautifully said. I mean, I'm thinking again, you know, living in a city that, uh, Alexander walked through and uh, it had as an ideal the, that notion of the, the Greek, the limits is what makes you free. And so we do have this weird time where, yeah, you may have limits in terms of, of money, uh, access to equipment, but within those, I think there's never been a more time, better time to be creative within those technical limitations because you can still produce something or edit something or share something. Um, so I think maybe this is a good time to move into uh, and you know, forgive me if I'm dragging you back a year, uh, but uh, since you have, uh, since we've just celebrated that kind of anniversary of that amazing panel you had at PRS and uh, the retroactive um, uh, celebration that is up, the trailer. There's a lot of the the trailers and and even some small films up on the YouTube channel that came up this weekend. So I'm wondering if we could talk a little bit about about that project, uh, Wellborn, uh, seeking truth beyond the le the Western lexicon. And probably we could spend an hour just on the title, but I'll let you take it any direction. You know, uh, congratulations on, I guess we've, we've made it another year. <laughs> you can look back and, and talk about that. That's a gift in itself. But uh, you know, wherever you want to go with it, I'd be, I'd be interested in hearing in, uh, about it. Uh, so go for, go for it. Yeah, well, I'll start with saying, uh, you know, it wouldn't have been possible without my co-curator, Yoon Win Ri, mm. and then also our um, invited co-curator, Candice Williams, mm. who is also an artist. I mean, they're both artists, and Yoon Win teaches at PRS, yes. and Candice teaches at CalArts. So, you know, I felt very honored to be working with them. Yeah. And that panel discussion was amazing. I really encourage people to watch the, the panel discussion. So, because the, these Thank voices you. are on yeah. it. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and um, also just like a plug for, for Candace's press called Cassandra Press. They have some really amazing readers that they're, they're putting out. And I know PRS like carried some of them. But that that also kind of if people are interested in some of the stuff that we talk, uh, talked about at Wellborn and some of the, the themes of the videos as well. Like there can be more information found through that. There, and, um, that and that's that's, but, that's Cassandra Press, correct? Mm -hmm. okay, yes. Yeah. Great. Great. Sure, yeah, I'm glad you, you mentioned it. Yes. Um, but yeah, so uh, I remember when I invited Yunwen to one of the lectures, I can't remember exactly what the, the topic was, but we got into a discussion about eugenics. And this is something that, that Yunwen has studied more extensively through their anthropological research. Mm -hmm. And it was something that I, I was 
interested in just in general, um, following patterns as well, humanity and, um, you know, questioning a lot of like the, well, the Western lexicon as I described it. Mm-hmm. Um, and seeing how at that time it, it felt like, you know, it was somewhat timely, but looking at it now, it feels more timely than ever with this pandemic. Yeah. Um, but going back to, to Wellborn, we wanted to do some some works that would help aid the project that we had been working on, which was neutrality. And this is the project that Yunwen was um, doing through a set of performances and was trying to, to make it like an ongoing work in multiple countries. And the, the story with that is they inherited a Nazi knife from their father. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they do a lot of spiritual healing work as well. And so most of it was really a, a practice and ritual mm-hmm. and seeing how mm-hmm. you know we can bring that into the forefront today with these discussions around our, our haunted pasts and all the, the trauma that we have accumulated as you know people in general. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, digging into that too was digging into the history of eugenics, which isn't really known, especially here in the United States, as far as like, you know, being so so based in a lot of the foundations of even today's policies and, you know, looking at the immigration crisis right now, which I'm very close to. Uh, both my parents were undocumented for, for most of my life. My mother still is. And so there is, so there's always that fear, right, of being found, found wow. out for, for being right. um, illegal, right? Yeah. And so all that is circulating around us and we're having this conversation around eugenics and we're doing this project and it was just again this like um, synchronicity that was forcing it to come together and thinking about the title of well born it being a direct translation of eugenics in the greek um, wow. eugenics, which i guess yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's the basis of it yeah. uh, and you know thinking about the kind of obsession really the platonic obsession with the, the ideal forms mm. or the theory of like you know this this sense of perfection of creating the perfect human and my own astrological research is founded more within traditional astrology or Hellenistic astrology that still takes into consideration a lot of that same ideology of like you know there is a wholeness of completion of perfection that we need to strive towards mm-hmm. and how that has really driven us and a lot of the most like unconscious ways even just like living our lives going down a linear route of wanting to separate ourselves from the sense of what's unideal or what is deemed as being lesser than um and this is for everyone it's not just you know white folks in the western world it's something that's like permeated our consciousness at such a deep level and so putting the show together along with like candace's help and um, her recruiting for students because she saw something within their works as well that really related to the sense of like the other of um you know what does the body mean in the sense of like you know trying to pursue this this higher way of existing this perfection this um, need for order this need for uh progression because that's another thing too it's like the history of eugenics here in the united states was also deeply embedded in the progressive movements and so when we talk about like our democracy or when we talk even just about like liberalism or neoliberalism, mm-hmm. we need to remember that that's not too far off. If, if it's like not even far off at all, like it's completely connected to the same ideologies. So it's not just a thing of like creating these easy binaries of good, bad, right or left. Right. It's understanding right. that it covers everything. Right. And so the people who can see that the most are the ones who don't belong in either camp. The ones who have been denied access. Um, and so, of course, historically, what is that? That is black and brown bodies. That's queer bodies. That's um, the labor class. That's mm-hmm. whatever has been seen as like not being um, good enough or engineered enough to mm-hmm. be a part of the, again, what I see as the Western lexicon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I've, I love that you highlighted, again, language seems to be a theme that keeps popping up, even though we're obviously so focused on uh, images and film and, you know, even archetypal images, images of the consciousness. Yeah. So, of course, you know, uh, how how it is attached to language. And and when you mentioned about, you know, the binary of good and evil, (laughs) you know, 
and you mentioned that the people who are excluded or, or thrown into one by a dominant paradigm, you know, but the reality is where none of us are either of those things. So it's very interesting yeah. that we've kind of, it fits with this dominant narrative theme, the, the hegemonic narrative and, and who's in, and who gains from having that in place. Um, and uh, I was thinking about, you know, in terms of the Western way of storytelling that you were talking about, it, it's kind of it's connected to some of these things you're talking about. And I was remembering, just flashed in my head, I was remembering this, this piece I read by uh, Leslie Marmon Silko, and she talks about stories in this, in this Native American tradition as it relates to place. Um, we wouldn't name the place and like kind of uh, impose something on it, but it was rather, you know, that, that river was where this happened. And then, and then that, that happened and that happened. So even the landscape was attached to these stories. That's how you kind of knew your, your land, which if you think about our sense of seeking, we're using stories, as you mentioned, as a, as a vehicle. But the yeah. but this Western yeah. a, approach, and maybe it's. I mean, I think Plato gets. You know, I think I think he's he's kind of like uh, used for everything. You know, he's so so big and so yeah. powerful and so dominant that you could probably use him for everything, good or bad. But uh, you know, as as seeing this this Western way of storytelling that's in, in different than the the Silco one that I just mentioned, and that just flashed in my head as as you were talking as it relates to these ultimately occupying and oppressive narratives that you un explored and unpacked so powerfully in, in that film, uh, Neuterology, um, with the images. What was amazing about your work, I thought, was these, you know, there is that ritual. I don't want to, I want people to watch the film, but there's the beginning of, of, you could say, what you think is a cleansing ritual. And then all of a sudden, in the vehicle of cleansing, maybe, which is the water, uh, you start to see the images of the trauma of the past and, and these narratives. And so I, I don't really know where my question's going, but uh, that was a very profound way of exploring the, these, uh, it was the dominating narratives that become oppressors to, to all of us, even those who are benefiting from them. They become Absolutely. destructive. Yeah. 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 And I, I think that's important to take note because it's more about, that unification process of understanding right. that because right. ultimately you know if it affects one it affects all right and there is that high and you know, it's very spiritual um seeking element too like we're trying to return to something we're trying to return to a wholeness yeah. and um one thing that is also really interesting with this particular project that that you know and um is still essentially doing is um they went to to austria and um saw one of the largest collections of um, like uh, Aztec Mayan um, artifacts and also just seeing in, in all museums, right? Like all these very special pieces that have yeah. been completely ripped apart from their, their homes and mm -hmm. how people have been stripped of it and continue to be stripped of it because these institutions continue to deny mm -hmm. their their connection because we, we see them as things of the past and they're yeah. removed. And then they're suddenly in these like clinical settings, which is also another big part of yeah. the humans part of um, the neutrality performance, uh, this sort of like clinical separation and categorization. And we can go into language with that too. It's sure. the way we define things and move them right of their essence. And, um, you know, having, having that be a big part as well of like how this, hegemonic narrative continues because it mm -hmm. cuts people off and this is something that has been discussed so much too through the um like native american wisdom of mm -hmm. you separate people not just in this uh, geographic sense but you separate them from their culture you separate mm -hmm. them from their rituals and their practices and you you rob them of power or at least you know enough for it to, to make them feel powerless um and another thing that I, like i'm a big fan of the um, philosopher Paul Aurelio, mm -hmm. who talks a lot about like um, speed and time and and place as well. And one of the things that um, came to mind was like this idea of like the end of history, which um, forget the author's name, but I think it's a for... I think it's Fukuyama. Are you thinking about Fukuyama, yeah, who claimed Fukuyama. that it's over, end of history? Or, you know, and Marx was the first yeah, one to throw yeah. that term out there, saying soon we'll get there, the end of history. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and, and even then that's so 
rooted in Western thinking. Yeah, right. And Virilio talks about um, how it's the end of geography, really, what we're seeing. Interesting. So it's, or, yeah, it's really fascinating. Um, he talks about how, like, uh, geography, that ending of, his, of history is more so tied to the end of geography because history will persist because we as people make our history. Right. But that disconnection with the land and then also going into, um, like, the sense of, like, the information bomb that has gone off and like, you know, we're, we're accelerating. We are yeah. accelerating in the sense and that acceleration is causing that constriction of the place. Yeah. Um, and so again, it goes back to like, uh, this is affecting everyone, even those that are benefiting from it right. because, you know, what is it going to accelerate towards? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I can't, I mean, I've gone off now the rails. No, it's great. That. It's great. It's great. Whenever I hear that that, uh, that Fukuyama end of history, I start to think, well, whose history? You know? Right. <laughs> it's a great response. It, it really opens it up. <laughs> I, I want to tell you how moved I was by, again, I don't want to give away. I really hope people will, will watch it. It's not long. It's an amazing, amazing work. Uh, that you that you have up there at New Durality. It's well worth the watch, but somewhere, somehow appears the quote that children have a right to be well-born. And um, that that's so interesting because, it, you know, in, the, in even great literature, I mean, that, that getting back to lexicon, we think of well-born as uh, the privileged, um, literally in terms of the money and the power and uh, opportunity. And that's not the right, obviously you're talking about because in a way that can be as dehumanizing maybe more comfortable and more fun for a little while but ultimately can be as destructive to the human spirit and what you're getting at is this notion of the children have the right to be well born in terms of inclusive and loved and uh, accepted and into community and i don't know if you wanted to say a little bit more about that because it seems to tie in uh what you were saying earlier yeah um I remember correctly I got that particular um like little slide I guess from a 1950s uh procedural video mm. and it was something that was essentially I think like pro-eugenics right so that was right. their right that was their argument of right. like you don't want your child to be born handicapped right for example right. that because that's right. fair to them and that makes you a good parent so that was and is the logic um and I, I do think when it one of the things that I wish we would have like gone into more or like something maybe in another reiteration of this we can mm-hmm. do, but it's looking at like disability and like mm-hmm. how um, we have this percentage of people that are completely neglected because they're disabled, because they're considered as a burden to society still. Yeah. And so, so much in our everyday lives, we forget that it can be such a hurdle for a person, like even just like wheelchair accessibility. Yeah. Um, you know, as someone who is able body, I know that I have to like, you know, really try and like remember that, you know, mm-hmm. that is my privilege. My mm-hmm. privilege is being able to even just like you know, walk somewhere. Um, and I think one of the, the, the biggest shortcomings of modern society is that lack of that care, that nurturing. It's something that you mentioned before earlier too, right? Like this Western, especially American mentality of like, you got to pull yourself up from the bootstraps. Right. But right. And it's, you know, it's also rooted in, in patriarchy, quite frankly. You know, it's that stern father that tells you if you fall, if you fall don't cry, get up, you yeah. know, be a man, like yeah. that whole thing we've internalized. And, and that's, um, you know, regardless of gender, mm-hmm. it's just a sense of like feeling we're out on our own with this. And so what we do is we end up, you know, completely cutting off people and blaming them in mm-hmm. fact of saying like you should be able to work harder you should be able to do more and in truth if we were truly as advanced as we want to think we would do everything we can to accommodate people because that is a way of of showing more um, technological advancement you know why not make everything accessible Mm -hmm. for anyone regardless of what they may have even if they had an iron lung you know if we were living in that time like we should have accessibility for that and it shouldn't be a thing of like considered a burden but really an opportunity to expand mm-hmm. our compassion and also our um, our revolutionary ways of thinking of, of a true enlightenment. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, it is interesting to think about, like, you know, well-born as having that double meaning. 
Uh, You know, you're you'll be born well into a society that will always love you no matter what. Mm -hmm. Or you can be born as like a you know, a a, was it the CRISPR thing, right? Where (laughs) you've been selected to have the right genes. Right, right, exactly. That's what I really admired. I didn't want to give away that move, but but since you did, what I really <laughs> admired was, yeah, you used it. The pers- the video, the, the image you used was not making the argument you were. <laughs> you 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 um, did what so often happens, but you kind of did it in reverse. Because when we think of, I mean, Emerson's an important thinker in a lot of ways in introducing this narrative of self reliance, and and he's a beautiful writer. But that becomes so bastardized to what you're talking about, uh, a way to dehumanize others or blame others or other others or, it, you know, it's your own fault. And, and you know, you do the reverse process. So you take this bastardized thing about what well-born is as presented by this sign in the 50s as protester, <laughs> I wrote, interestingly, protester, saying you deserve to be well born, but in the eugenics way, and through your film and through the power of that, it becomes something, not just its opposite, but something in a way that what we seek in esoteric studies, you know, something, the light really comes through those words, or in an Nazi way, the light is restored to that, that idea or that sentence, and that sentence kind of is freed or expanded in a way that reflects, I think, all of our journeys. And, and what you were saying earlier about not only dehumanizing the, the person in their, their lives, but we're, the, their, their spiritual process and ultimately their offering to others. I mean, it's criminal. It's criminal when you think about the scale that it's done, whatever the mechanism or the language is that keeps us apart or othered or um, privileges one section over, over another. But uh, I did also want to mention the, uh, I was really amazed by uh, the film. You'll have to correct me if I'm pronouncing it wrong. Is it Acida? Acidia? Acidia. Acidia, yeah. Sterling. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's, I don't, we don't need to spend too much time talking about it. I really I encourage people to watch all of those uh, films that are up in the trailers and, and really, really check them out. They're on the, the Philosophical Research Society YouTube channel. But what I loved was actually the description of the word and how it relates to me now during this pandemic time, because in the description underneath the uh, film talks about acedia is a term uh, that describes a state of listlessness or torpor of not caring or not being concerned with one's position in the world. And, uh, Obviously, a lot of us are having that this imposed on us by uh, uh, this weird lockdown mentality and disconnection and uncertainty. We're all kind of experiencing this, but it shows us uh, the beauty within it. And I may it made me think of that that Buddhist, uh, the famous Buddhist saying of uh, "Don't do something, just sit there." You know. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I, I really yeah. love, I think I, I needed to hear that now because torpor is a word I don't think I used a lot until the, I guess, starting March when you have this kind of mental mm-hmm. torpor and this kind of, and a lot of it's from you know, from what's going on with, with, with COVID. But I don't know, as the, as the curator uh, with your colleagues and uh, the partners of this, I just want to, if you had a, a something like that, as you think about these films now that you strikes you differently or more powerfully in this post COVID seeking world that we're, we're in like this. I don't think it would have, I don't think I'd be talking to you about this phrase, this word and its definition. If we did it last year, it was very interesting. Absolutely. And um, definitely it adds more power. I don't think it, it's changed what I had seen in it, but rather it's, Again, like more people are understanding yeah. it from that deep fundamental level. Uh, one thing that Sterling had mentioned is, you know, this idea of stillness and mm-hmm. stillness really as a form of um, survival, as well as, um, you know, a way of protesting in a sense. Uh, and it goes back to this conversation around speed and time, yeah. where uh, in a society and it deeply capitalistic society that runs on progression that runs and runs and runs yeah one of the best things to do in um protest of that is to be still and unfortunately you know it's taken this global pandemic for a lot of people to start
start to understand really what that means. But I, I see it, I mean, we have to, and at this point, we have to see it as an opportunity to change ourselves. And I think a big part of that is practicing that stillness. Yeah. And, um, you know, one of the, I think also the very powerful things of, of Sterling's work too, is as like, a, as a black presenting male, to mm -hmm. see that stillness on film is something that unfortunately we have come across so much too much mm -hmm. um in media mm -hmm. and that lifelessness of someone yeah. and now to see it in this context within the natural world and not in a, in a violent one mm -hmm. but rather again one in a, this acedia sense of yeah. you don't really know what exactly it is but there is a, a discomfort there yeah. <laughs> right yeah. we have to be still yeah and, um, they also they do their performance um, in person as well. So they, they have also done in galleries the same a similar performance as of being still. Um, and so it, you know it is a very significant work. And mm -hmm. going back to the the ideas of well born, um, especially between uh, neutrality, you know, and eyes work, there is a sense right of like constant progression, of constant like you know mm -hmm. linearity of kind of being in that tunnel mm -hmm. and. In that tunnel, we lose the, the peripheral, and so Sterling's work, as you know, that still body is, is, is exactly kind of like what so much is fighting against, mm -hmm. and you know why we're we're being pushed right to like you know pull ourselves up from the bootstraps as a global society, even though there's a pandemic that's raging on. You yeah, know, yeah. you got to get back to work, or you got to figure it out, get yourself a mask. Like we're doing everything that I feel that we're being told not to do. By so many other forces, which is mm -hmm. just to be still, which mm -hmm. is just to um, sit in our discomfort. Yeah. And I, I imagine there's going to be a lot more people turning to Buddhism at the end of this, mm -hmm. <laughs> like, you know, who are going to actually be going out and being practicing Buddhists because they're being forced into, um, you know, this internal dive mm -hmm. psyche into like mm -hmm. what um, makes someone feel uncomfortable, what makes someone feel fearful all these things that can't be achieved if you're keeping yourself busy with like, you know, the mundane tasks of work or of uh, routines, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like we're picking on Plato and we're not, but we are picking a little on this idea of perfection. But it was interesting that in the word stillness that you used is it wasn't, you know, as people went into kind of lockdown mode, you know, there was some of this, you know, I'm going to start a business or I'm going to figure out, but it also, it also um, affected quote unquote spiritual matters, right? I'm going to meditate better. I'm going to do yoga better. I mean, you know, that's not still this either, you know, as you as you mentioned. So it's amazing how how internalized and traumatized traumatizing that narrative of doing something. Which is why I love the the Buddhist quote of don't you know uh, uh, don't just uh, don't do something, just sit there. That's hard. And but as soon as we start thinking that's hard, I got to get better at sitting there. Then we're replicating the problem, <laughs> you know. And yeah. so yeah. So but it's taken this time to really, really show us what stillness and torpor is. You know, as you know from synchronicity, you know that's we're shown what we need, I guess. Um, and I, I do want to. We're running out of time. I, I thank you so much for giving uh, giving giving us so much of your time. And uh, this is not a slight to any other films out there, but I feel like I need to mention the, the work Heavy Feelings uh, because it, besides the obvious subject matter of uh, the, the genocide of the Khmer Rouge regime in Cambodia, but it, it so powerfully demonstrates how that was not that long ago. You know, we tend to think in years, but when you think, oh, that's just my mother and grandmother, and then they're telling that story about it. You know, it wasn't that long ago that um, it's the 75th anniversary uh, or 75th anniversary of the, the end of World War II. We tend to think that's a long time, but that's 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 one that's a tripart generation, you know, child, parent and grandma. And when you see it like in that short film or I guess it's a trailer is it's really it's really uh, impossible to ignore how close we are generationally and that brings a hold and then of course learning about the specific aspects of i don't, I don't know if in america we don't study that enough but i just thought that was an amazing work and uh anything else you want to kind of say about uh is there 
a question you wish you would have been asked uh, for the panel or, or asked of each other, or maybe a year later, looking back, one more kind of thing that you would like to, I don't know, throw out there before, before we kind of move on and conclude? Uh, just a quick expansion on that particular work. Have oh, you thank you. Yeah, I please, been please. A, I, kind of, um, I think the other thing too, you know, it's a shame we can't like show the whole thing, but mm -hmm. um, it's about a minute and a half long. And so yeah. we can definitely get the gist of it. But mm -hmm. that sense of, again, like you were saying, the, the trauma that none of us is really like safe from in a sense. Yeah. And yeah. Um, also like how these burdens are feeling a little bit heavier because we're having to be still at the same time. Right. And so I think it is a very interesting connection to um, the Asadia piece is that one of the hardest things that we have to do is we have to carry the weight of either ourselves or parents or grandparents. And mm -hmm. now we're really understanding what strength is. And mm -hmm. so I think that's, um, you know, something that people can and maybe like go into thinking as well. It's, um, you know, how does it affect our bodies quite literally? And then how does it um, kind of play out over time if we're constantly carrying these burdens? Mm -hmm. And I hope that people who watch these videos as well, like understand that none of us is so different as we think we are, you know, we have our struggles. We all have like our different timings and we're all on you know, different timelines in a sense, but, you know, ultimately, like you were saying, these massacres, these um, huge points of history aren't that long ago. Like, yeah. We're not completely separated from them and we're still telling the story right now. And I think what we're seeing is, is a culmination of so many things that haven't been told and haven't been, um, you know, studied in the right way or have been, you know, exposed by the right people in a sense. And when I say rightness, I say it's like, you know, the stories who, where they actually come from, the people who are actually affected by these things and not right. just some scholar writing a text with something. Right. Right. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I don't know what else to add to that. I just hope that people watch the works and also allow themselves to, to really interpret it for themselves and how it relates to, to their time right now. And, and also like being able to see or, you know, figure out for themselves what the future holds mm -hmm. because we're in this ongoing narrative and especially here in the united states I mean, it is global but united states is seeing a real i think ending of things in a mm -hmm. sense of you know what is what has our history been since this uh, country was founded mm -hmm. and um a lot of a lot of the things that it didn't quite go into in this conversation but it was um you know decolonizing mm -hmm. not just like the epistemic sense of you know, what we're studying, but decolonizing our spirituality, decolonizing mm -hmm. our um, intellectualism, these institutions, everything. And like, what does that actually mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, it's a very, it is, that's a whole other conversation because as someone living abroad, um, there's a lot of talk about decolonizing in America while we are doing many things that are crimes against a lot of the same people we're expect, you know, we're protesting for. A lot mm -hmm. of, a lot yeah. of black and brown people around the world. It's, yeah. it's very, it's very, yeah. it's, it's very, very interesting, interesting time. And that's, but I love how your work reflects. It, it never strays too far from the stories uh, in the aid of the seeker. Um, it does. It's not afraid, as you said, to go into these areas that that we didn't get to talk about as much. But it also doesn't doesn't lose. I think that journey you're on uh, as a filmmaker and an artist, uh, as, a, uh, as all of the things you are. So I really, I commend you for that. I, I really appreciate the time. And just two quick things uh, before I let you go into the LA heat. It's actually still pretty hot in Izmir. Um, but one, I, 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 lo I love your Instagram uh, <laughs> username is Strip Mall Dreams because there's there's so many uh, kind of entry points into that. And you could even go down to the spiritual level. Again, as a Gnostic, you know, the whole, well, yeah, the whole world's a strip mall. You know, we figured it out finally. And, uh, now, you know, it's not going to get, we got to free ourselves in a way. But, yeah. but I now, it, it, I'm just curious if that came from your time growing up in the Valley. Was it more of an intellectual thing as you started to develop as a filmmaker in CBI that this could be symbolic of maybe some of these aspects you're talking about in American culture? Did you see it in the spiritual? So 
But what's your relationship to that that wonderful uh, term? Because it does include it's that it may be a strip mall, but the dream isn't dead, right? And so we can talk <laughs> about just that for a while. But yeah, I, I for, yeah. if you would, would don't mind indulging me for a few minutes, I'd love to hear about it. Yeah, happily. Um, it's definitely a combination of the two. Uh, growing up in the Valley, it's, <laughs> again, like all over. Um, and the rate that they pop up, it's just unbelievable. And I, I mean, I, I love mundanity. I got to say that too. Like, I just, I love mm -hmm. when you see garbage on the ground. Not in the sense of like in the ecological sense, right. but just as far as like, you know, you wonder how did this get here? Right. And that to me is something definitely like in the, the pursuit of, of a spiritual knowledge, I suppose, um, has led me to, to look at strip malt strip malls as, as that mm -hmm. um i've also always just had very bizarre dreams with strip malls interesting or evolving strip malls and wow. i guess that's like a direct um, connection to having grown up around it so much mm -hmm. um and especially just like thinking about i haven't traveled a whole lot around america i've gone to like i've done a couple of road trips around the southwest but you know you get to these towns where there's nothing but like Applebee's and like, you know, Carl's Jr. Right? <laughs> or like, you know, whatever you see in between. Mm -hmm. And then you have these like small little strip malls as well. And, and it does kind of tie in this like absurdity of America and this absurdity of the American dream. Um, and I, I find so much humor in there too. And I think that was something that I didn't quite bring up because of course, like the peace neutrality doesn't quite hold a lot of humor in it but um <laughs> a lot of the work that i'm also attracted to has even if it's just like a dark comedy mm -hmm. then there is like sometimes a punchline you know and yeah. I, I like to think of it almost as like um waiting for godot like that second uh beckett way of like looking at what is the punchline you know are we mm -hmm. waiting for the punchline is it going mm -hmm. to happen and strip malls to me are just like a punchline <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> yeah. like all yeah. this is happening but here's another nail salon you know <laughs> yeah yeah it's the waiting that's the punchline yeah i love that that's great well thank you for that i'm definitely going to follow you on uh, strip mall <laughs> dreams and then the last thing i know you're getting ready uh, to, to 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 get busy with american film institute again as you're going to roll into <laughs> your semester and your work and your you know your craft but before you go, is there any um, anything you've watched or read uh, recently, maybe since COVID started, that, that you would recommend that's been interesting to you on your your journey as an artist, but also on your the deeper journey on that that hero's journey you uh, talked about so nicely that started from a, a conversation in a bar about God. Uh, speaking of. of uh, uh, waiting for Godot, but any anything you want to recommend uh, to us, or anything that you had would, would particularly moved or touched by, or maybe you just watched Twin Peaks again. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I'll, I'll probably always be watching Twin Peaks at some <laughs> point in my life. <laughs> but uh, the the thing that came to mind, just because I was just talking with a friend about it, was the show Ten Fifteen on Hulu. I think Which I think you a, may have I think you may have dropped out a bit. Is it called Pen Pen Fifteen, like P E M? Pen Fifteen. Okay. Yeah, P E N One Five. Okay. Uh, I mean, it's kind of like a play on Interesting. <laughs> on, on words. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's, that's uh, funny. It's basically yeah, it's like a like a middle school comedy, but the creators of the show and the the two lead actors are in like their thirties and they're playing essentially themselves when they were around 13. Wow. And interesting. That has been really interesting to watch because um again like my personal life I'm about to turn 30. So mm -hmm. I feel a lot of uh, especially with this quarantine time looking back on like my my journey again of like who was I that like awkward 13 year old at mm -hmm. school and understanding like I'm not really that different. I'm not that different in the sense like I've held on to so many things that I felt defined me um, throughout my adolescence and then even just into young adulthood mm -hmm. and seeing more and more, especially just like studying people and studying these cycles that people were essentially run by like these babies, these children who 
have become adults, right? But there's still that same child, that same wounded child, mm -hmm. that same um, abused child at some points, or maybe someone who felt awkward, like all these things that we carry in us. And it can come in a very physical sense. Like I think about, um, you know, slouching and like this lack of confidence that mm -hmm. maybe someone has felt their entire life. And then they realize, oh, like my back literally is representing how I felt my whole life, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so that particular show, you know, I don't think it's meant to be, or, you know, I don't know. I, I think there's a lot of depth to it that some people mm -hmm. might miss out on. Right. Uh, but I think it's really important to look at ourselves and see like how much have we changed with certain things when we were just reaching puberty and that goes for anyone no matter how old they are yeah. Um, yeah. so I really recommend that <laughs> <laughs> that's great I hadn't heard about that I mean it's hard to I'm kind of out of touch uh, out here but that's great that's a great set pen one five um <laughs> that, yeah. that's a brilliant again a brilliant title on Hulu okay <laughs> All right, great. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it's been a pleasure, uh, really a pleasure to, to speak with you. Uh, if uh, people want to catch, kind of get in contact with you or stay in touch with your work, would you would you recommend? Is, would you give us your website or uh, we 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 have your Instagram out there? I think we've talked about that enough. But but what's the the website in in terms of to keep up with your work and and new projects and uh, new endeavors? Yeah, I think uh, for keeping up, Instagram is definitely the best thing. But mm -hmm. um, I also try to keep my website pretty like up to date. So that's etvasquez, B A Z Q U E Z dot com. Very simple, my name. <laughs> okay, great. Um, and that has yeah, that has more of my work. And yeah, we'll see what what I'm able to do. I'm still painting. I'm still drawing, but. We'll see what uh, school has in store for me. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're, you're. Uh, I mean, the, the, those film. I've said it before, and it, you're an amazing kind of film artist, and it's exciting that you're, you're exploring deeper the screenwriting because I know you're going to bring these kind of non-linear storytelling traditions that you're interested in, uh, in exciting ways, and that you're. I really wish you luck on that. I'm really thankful that you're kind of connecting people with uh, with PRS, with the Philosophical Research Society. I think one of the most inspiring things that we've covered a lot of grounds is that uh, a rather, uh, I don't know if it was a heated argument or if it was a humorous argument or what, but uh, the, the, the littlest argument about uh, God in a bar may lead to a whole... Uh, a whole journey through uh, yourself as uh, <laughs> in the halls, uh, hall, the sacred halls or the, the beautiful halls and spaces of the Philosophical Research Society. So I, I love that, that you shared that. And all of us are missing the place. Um, but uh, I do encourage people to check out uh, the, the YouTube uh, content on the, the Philosophical Research Society channel, not just these amazing films we're talking about with the well-born project, but even going back, and uh, as someone who lived in L.A., I really recommend Greg's L.A. Uh, series. Uh, that, that's that's a, a, an amazing uh, group of lectures he did. So uh, thank you so much, Liz, and thank everyone for uh, subscribing and, and sharing the video. And um, again, you can visit prs.org for uh, updates on uh, the, the online and hopefully someday not too distant future the physical uh, space events and of course visit the new expanded online store personally as i mentioned i love that they've taken time to get all the the used uh, a lot of the used books on there and uh, if you can make a donation your your support and just your engagement with the community is is really is really appreciated so Thank you so much, Liz. Good luck with the heat wave. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> I hope to see you at you, I hope to see you at PRS uh, sometime uh, in the not too distant future. And uh, best of luck. Thank you. You too.